Matthew chapter 16. We have a number of scriptures we're going to look at tonight. Many years ago, there was a Catholic priest who lived across the street from a Baptist church. And this is a true story. On one occasion, uh, the Baptist church, I don't know why, but they invited uh, the priest to come over for a question and answer time. I don't know why. Maybe they wanted to barbecue him. All right, but, uh, but they asked him to come over. And so one of the members asked the priest, we'll call him Father John. They said, all right, Father John, what do you admire most about the Baptist? Without hesitation. And almost immediately, the priest blurted out, freedom. That fast. And you know what? He hit the nail on the head. <laughs> He'd never experienced it before. He was wishing he had it. Baptists, more than any other religion or denomination, have understood and celebrated freedom from the beginning. As you saw last week, it is not in ourselves. It is founded in scriptures, in the scriptures. The word of God has the power to bring freedom to an individual, which can spread throughout a society if it is allowed free course. If it's not allowed free course, it still provides freedom to the individual. It's an amazing thing. I mean, so people in China, uh, they have experienced, the, the Christians over there have experienced freedom. They've experienced a spiritual freedom even though they are oppressed. They understand that freedom because they have found Christ. But when a society uh, allows the word of God to have free course, then what happens is even in a society, the effects of biblical freedom can spread. What we have seen, and we have uh, basically for the last about five years, we have pounded this in our church, and we've tried to present this to you so that you are uh, understanding this, and we're trying to caution our families and caution against the world. What the world has done basically for now a half a century, so think about that, for five decades, uh, biblical freedom has been pushed down in America. It has been pushed down. Whether you know it or not, it has been pushed down. So the effects, we're going to uh, read an excerpt at the end of our message uh, from a man named Robert Winthrop. And he explains what happens if you suppress the Word of God. And so tonight we're talking about, we, we said there's four essential freedoms that are basically ingrained into Baptist. Last week we said Bible freedom. Tonight we're going to talk about soul freedom. Next week, church freedom. And then in June, probably closer to July 4th, we're going to talk about religious freedom. So those are the four freedoms that are basically ingrained into uh, Baptist. Bible freedom. And we saw last week how important it is, because that's the foundation. But soul freedom. Soul freedom has been named a bunch of things throughout history. It's been named individual competency, all right? It's been named personal faith. Uh, some people call it experiential religion. Some call it the priesthood of the believer. Uh, some say individualism and religion. But we call it individual soul liberty. So individual soul liberty. Where do we uh, find this? We find it in Scripture, but I'm going to take you to a passage that most of the time we don't look at for soul freedom. But it's interesting, Jesus kind of introduces this to his disciples. Look at Matthew 16 and verse 13. Those of you that went on the Israel trip, I can still picture this. All right, I can st this is one of my favorite places in Israel, Caesarea Philippi. All right, Caesarea Philippi in, in verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he's interested in what people are saying about him. So they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or so one of the prophets. Then Jesus turns it personal to soul freedom. Look what he says. But whom do you say? That I am. You know what? It's a personal thing. It's an individual thing. Christ cares what you think. He cares about your opinion, and it is important that you have an opinion. And soul freedom 
is very important. It's one of our, uh, it's one of our tenets. It's, it's, uh, Baptists have often been accused of being excessively individualistic. Uh, this idea of soul freedom was fought for by our ancestors in two areas. They fought for it in believer's baptism and the individual right to worship. Worship. So believer's baptism, uh, you can go way back uh, into uh, Europe, and soul freedom wasn't allowed. In fact, you can look up John Calvin and Martin Luther and Zwingli. Those were all leaders in the Protestant movement, and they didn't like the idea of soul freedom. And you know why they didn't like the idea of soul freedom? Because of what happens sometimes. You know what happens with soul freedom? You get a whole lot of nut jobs. And guess what we have in Baptist? A whole bunch of nut jobs. All right? You got Westboro Baptists who basically are completely ridiculous. There's probably a whole bunch of insanity. They all should be checked into insane asylums. All right? So you have that. And why is that? Because we believe as in soul freedom. You should be able to worship God the way you see fit. Now, I should be able to make fun of anybody that I see fit, but here you have Westboro on this side, but then you may not know he claims to be a Baptist, so that's Westboro, and they're, they're like extreme, they're radical, they're crazy. Then way on the other side, guess who claims to be a Baptist? Rick Warren. You might not have known that. Rick Warren, basically one of the largest, uh, largest, uh, I guess it would be, the largest Baptist church in America runs it, and it's crazy. I mean, he's got, you can look it up, he's got uh, probably uh, 10 or 12 dif different types of venues. I think he has a, a Hawaiian venue, uh, he has a rock and roll venue, he has uh, a traditional venue, I don't know, um, you know, maybe a seance venue. I mean, it's crazy all the different services that he has. And he's so close to not even teaching salvation. I mean, it's... I mean, he borderlines right on heresy with a lot of his stuff. So here you have all these extremes. And you'd say, why has that happened in, in Baptist? Because we believe in soul freedom. So Zwingli and John Calvin and Luther, they didn't like that idea. They said, man, you, you allow man to just worship like he wants to. Guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a bunch of crazy people. Yep, it is. But we believe we have a biblical basis for it. We believe that that's Bible. So you can go over to Switzerland and uh, Zwingli, there's a statue of Zwingli, and he, I believe he's either holding the Bible or holding some documents, and he's holding a sword. Because basically, you're going to believe what we do or we're going to kill you. All right? <laughs> it was, uh, there, that's how you, uh, that's how you, ins uh, in uh, implement these things. So they believed, even when they came over to America, the Puritans even believed this, they were getting away from the Anglicans, and they said, they are crazy. They're making us do things that we don't believe we should do in worship. So they came over, and they established a state church. Massachusetts, look it up. That's what it was. It was a state-run church. And so then, your son, and I'm thinking of going down since the, since the governor's crazy anyways, I'm thinking, why not go down there and institute this? <laughs> At least we'll get some funds. But basically, some of your taxes was separated and went to the church. Not a bad idea. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm thinking, let's do that one. All right. I might find that in Scripture some way. I'm thinking I can yank a pass. No, I'm just... I'm just being serious, no, just uh, joking. But guess what? They, they had a state-run church. Some of their taxes went there. And actually, in uh, Georgia, you can look this up in Georgia, if, if you didn't go to church, if you were, uh, I think, in politics and things like that, if you didn't go to church on some Sunday, they would go and find you. You say, well, it's state-run. Baptists have always held to soul freedom. It's not by constraint on the outside. I believe it's something that happens from the inside out. And it needs to happen. It's a balance. All right, I understand that. But we're going to look at that this evening. Pray that this evening as we look at this idea of soul freedom, that it would help us. It would help us to understand what we have 
the heritage we have, but then how important it is that it stays that way in America. Soul freedom. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us this evening as we look at this concept. Give us wisdom and guidance. I pray, Lord, uh, that we'd be able to clearly define this through Scripture and through history. And Lord, that it would help us in our lives as individuals, help us to understand how important it is. Lord, as always, do that which I cannot do, and that is speak to hearts. We ask and claim your power in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have four points if you copied the outline down there's four points the first one is soul freedom defined and so i came up with a definition so soul freedom it's the belief that man was created individually by god so we kind of believe that so that individual creation soul freedom is that man was created individually he was fearfully and wonderfully made so it's, a, it's also asserted that each man on his own then must come to a saving faith in the Son of God. So when they believed in infant baptism, what were they doing with infant baptism? They were basically kind of saying that, well, uh, they, were, they were sinners, and that's going to get rid of the original sin. That, that, that baby has no idea what they're doing, so... There's no way they can make a decision. That is a Baptist thing. We're like, no, 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 you can't do that because it's an individual thing. That's why even we're careful when we deal with somebody. Uh, as, as I was dealing with this man uh, after church this morning, uh, I went through the thing and, and I said, now, this is something you have to do and I'll help you, but I want you to pray to God. I don't, I don't pray and call out to God. You got to pray out to call to God. And what was interesting, as we were going through Scripture, he had a lot of Catholic background, and so he was tying baptism to salvation. And I said, I think your problem is that you think baptism gets you saved. So we went through the plan of salvation, and when we got done, he looked, and he goes, that's it? I said, yeah. He goes, that's really simple. I said, it is. It is very simple, but that's what you have to do. And it's an individual choice, though. It's something that each of us have to do. So soul freedom defined is it asserts that each man on his own must come to a saving faith in the Son of God, and each individual is, uh, is allowed to worship God as they see fit. So I mentioned this last night in prayer meeting. You can look it up. There's actually a website uh, that has copied and put all these so you can read it through. John Bunyan was brought to trial, and somebody wrote about it. It's called the Breed Love Papers, B-R-E-E, -E, Breed Love Papers. And so you can look it up, and somebody has uh, put it uh, so that it's available kind of in a PDF format. But the Breed Love Papers are recording John Bunyan coming before Judge Wingate. So I copied a little bit off of, of of John Bunyan coming before, and this, I believe, is in 1660. So Judge Wingate, this is what he says, Mr. Bunyan, you stand before this court accused of persistent and willful transgression of the covenantal act, which prohibits all British subjects from absenting, absenting, absenting themselves from worship in the Church of England and from conducting worship services apart from our church. You come presumably with no legal training and yet without counsel. I must warn you, sir, of the gravity of the charge, the harshness of the penalty in the event of your conviction and the full hardiness of acting as your own counsel and so serious a matter. Are you cognizant of these facts and do you understand the charge? And, and in his words, he says, I am and I do, my Lord. Then Bunya says, thank you, my Lord. Later on, after he's talking a little bit, he says, and may I say that I am grateful for the opportunity to respond. First, the dispositions, uh, depositions speak the truth. I have never attended services in the Church of England, nor do I atten atten intend ever to do so. Secondly, it is no secret that I preach the word of God whenever, wherever, and to whomever he pleases to grant me opportunity to do so. Having said that, my Lord, 
there is a weightier issue that I'm constrained to address. I have no choice but to acknowledge my awareness of the law which I'm accused of transgressing. Likewise, I have no choice but to confess my guilt and my transgression of it. As true as these charges are, these charges are I must affirm that I neither regret breaking the law nor repent of having broken it. Further, I must warn you that I have no intention in future of conforming to it. It is on its face an unjust law, a law against which honorable men cannot shrink from protesting. In truth, my Lord, it violates an infinitely higher law, the right of every man to seek God in his own way, unhindered by any temporal power. That, my Lord, is my response. And guess what happened? He went to jail for that. Our heritage is that men stood their ground because they believed that it was a God-given right for them to worship God the way they saw fit. That's soul freedom. And no state, no hierarchy, no government can come in and say, this is what you have to do. And in fact, uh, we were reading about this. So if you haven't followed a little bit with Queen Nero in Chicago, so one of the things, one of the churches, she's like, I don't know, has, a, has an ax to grind or a, 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 a torch to light, uh, is a Romanian Baptist church. Romanian Baptist church. So yesterday night, she enforced and sent her uh, hit squad out, and uh, within three blocks of the Romanian church, she blocked off no parking so that they would have to violate that if they parked in there. And they interviewed the Romanian pastor. What's interesting is, he says, you know what? We do some online, and it's fine to do some online, but you don't understand, I have some of my congregants. Guess where they came from? Communist Romania under Cusescu in the 80s, and he said, I can't do this to them. Because they keep saying, this is how it started over there. Unbelievable. So, he's, so they're saying, no, 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 no. We have to have church. We're not going through this again. It's amazing, because guess what they learn? Soul freedom. It's a Baptist tenet. Praise the Lord for men that were willing to pay the price to give us this blessed truth of liberty of conscience, soul Freedom. So that's defined. Secondly, soul freedom displayed through history. I'm going to give you three examples. We may not do all of them, but I'll quickly go through. I I listed them out on the outline because then you have their names and you can look it up as far as Baptist history. There's three men. There's Roger Williams. He lived from 1603, they say maybe, to 1683. There's Isaac Bacchus. He lived from 1724 to 1806, and then John Leland, 1754 to 1841. So Roger Williams. Williams, who had developed a reputation for scholarship and piety as a clergyman in England, brought his family to the, a colony to Massachusetts uh, basically right after it had start, uh, started. Uh, Winthrop who knew him, held him as a godly minister, and the Boston church immediately offered him a post. Uh, it, was, it was one of the greatest positions in English America. They offered to Roger Williams. Williams declined, spurning the church as insufficiently committed to the proper worship of God. And this astonishing charge would put him at odds with the colony's leaders till the day he died. Williams Uh, did not differ with them on any really point of theology, which is interesting, all right, because today we would differ with some of their theology. Williams at that time really did not differ a lot with their theology. They shared the same faith, all worshiping the God of the universe, seeing God in every facet of life, seeing man's purpose at advancing the kingdom of God. But the colony's leader, both lay and clergy, firmly believed that the state must prevent error in religion. They believed that the success of the Massachusetts plantation depended upon it being from the top, from government. And that's why they were establishing that. Williams believed that preventing error in religion was impossible. 
for it required people to interpret God's law, and people would inevitably err. And guess what? That happens. In Baptists, you have that today. All right, I'm sure in 50 years, uh, you're gonna, people are going to look back at our era, and they're going to see, oh, you know what? They probably were a little off on that, but we talked about that last week. That's Bible freedom. Bible freedom, and we go back to that Gainsborough con uh, conf uh, Confession, in the 1600s, and the Gainsborough Confession it says that the Lord will lead us, or the Lord will make known, or will, uh, or it will be made known. So the Bible has the authority to change us. So as I come to Scripture, sometimes I look and I'm like, wow, I guess that is a little different than what I thought. Why? Because the Bible has the authority to change me. The, and sometimes you're going this way and God's like, no, 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 no. Why? Because we're human. God is infinite, all right? God is omniscient. God has all the wisdom in the world, but guess who he gave his word to? You and I, who are a bunch of imbeciles, all right? We, we, don't, have, uh, we don't have all knowledge. And so we have to understand that sometimes that's going to happen. We're going to be in error sometime. So William said, it doesn't matter. Then the government, all right, you think that there's going to be a perfect government? No, there's not going to be that. Not going to be a perfect government. So he therefore concluded that government must remove itself from anything that touched upon human beings, relationship with God. A society built on the principles Massachusetts espoused would lead at best to hypocrisy because forced worship, he said, stinks in God's nostrils. That's in his words. He said, forced worship stinks in God's nostril. What he said is, you can't force this. It's got to be something God does in the heart. Now, should we preach hard? Yes. And should, and should we preach on holiness and, and we preach on God's purity and we preach on God's judgment? That's what we do. But when we come to an invitation, we're, we're not saying, you better get down here right now. We can't do that. Why? Because we believe in soul freedom. It only is good if God is doing the work. God has to do that work in the heart. So Roger Williams, he's one of the guys we look to in history, Baptist history, that helped us, Isaac Backus. Isaac Backus, it's interesting because his mom, Elizabeth Bacchus, uh, her and her husband went to church, and they went basically to the state church or whatever, but she was drawn to George Whitfield's preaching, and so she would go and hear him preach. She was, uh, uh, her husband was a, a man of wealth, and uh, they had joined, but they had joined a congregational church. Her husband had not made a profession of faith, and despite her husband's lack of serious interest in spiritual manners, she raised children to follow the admonition of the Lord, and some of that was because of George Whitfield. Her husband passed away, and uh, he died of uh, measles, actually, in 1740, leaving her uh, with 11 children, but he had some means, so she was pretty wealthy. She spent her days constantly asking God why he had stricken her with more than she could bear, and then providentially, God brought the great awakening and restored her hope. And one of her sons, was, his name was Isaac. And Isaac Bacchus was saved at an early age, and I believe partly because of the great awakening, but partly because of her association with George Whitfield is amazing when you see all of God working. So providentially, then Isaac Bacchus was brought into this world, was saved. Several of Bacchus's parishioners uh, faced prison for refusing to pay the religious tax in Massachusetts. He and other Baptist leaders supported the American Revolution, believing that they would have greater freedom of conscience under a new system of government. Through petitions and personal visits to the Continental Congress, Isaac Bacchus fought for religious liberty throughout the Revolutionary War. According to the theories, 
that Bacchus developed during this period, the civil authority had no right to pass judgment in matters of religion. He also believed that churches should be supported only by private voluntary gifts and that the official church of New England should be disestablished so that true religion could flourish. His strong voice and popular pamphlets echoes the cries for religious liberty proclaimed by another man that was before him, Roger Williams. Bacchus' theories based in small part on Williams' writings would eventually triumph in America, paving the way for constitutional amendments that guaranteed religious freedom. So you have Roger Williams, you have Isaac Bacchus, and then you have John Leland. John Leland was a Massachusetts-born Baptist minister. He spent most of his ministry, though, in Virginia, where he became an ally to Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. You can read a little bit about um, John Leland. What's interesting is John Leland grew in importance uh, kind of in the Baptist world, and James Madison actually came to John Leland and said, hey, um, I need your support to get into office. All right, it still happens. You see, you know, a couple of uh, politicians every once in a while roaming around. They're like, hey, hey, can you help me? All right, you know why? It goes back to this time when, guess what? B Baptists were very involved. And so um, John Leland sat down with James Madison and went uh, through and talked about the Constitution, and he said, I have a problem with it because it doesn't seem like there is enough religious liberty, and they came up with the idea of the Bill of Rights. And he said, if you do this with the Bill of Rights, then I will back you. And I'll get other Baptists to back you. And guess what we have today? We have a Bill of Rights because James Madison and a Baptist pastor teamed up together. John Leland. Leland was a key player in convincing Madison to include a guarantee of religious liberty. The 10 amendments that were added to the U.S. Constitution in 1791, government has no more to do with the religious opinions of men than it has with the principles of mathematics. That's what John Leland said. Leland argued and said, let every man worship according to his own faith, either one God, three gods, no God, or 20 gods. Let government protect him in so doing. And that's what we said. And you'd say, wait a minute, is that what? Yes. Because guess what? That's soul freedom. That's, that's what we believe. That's what America was built on. And it's not built on regulating it. It's not built on restricting it. It's not built on financing it. Why? Because guess what? When man ever gets involved in religion, he corrupts it. It's between me and God, and that's it. That's why this is in some cases called the priesthood of the believer, because I don't have to go through somebody. There is no, there is, there is a mediator between God and man, and it is not found on this earth. It is the man, Christ Jesus. I go through him, and that is it. And that's the legacy we have. So there are three men. So where is it found? Do we have a Bible basis for soul freedom? We do. We already mentioned Genesis chapter 1. So in, in Genesis uh, chapter 1, it said in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. So God made man. It's also found in Psalm 8. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set the gl thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over, uh, over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea, O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So, Where's the biblical basis? God created man individually. I've been saying that over and over to our church 
and I think at the end, when I give you uh, just in a couple minutes, and I give you some tips and some warnings, one of the things that I think that we can't handle as as a, as a church sometimes, as churches, as Americans sometimes, is difference. And yet God made all of us different. I, I'm sorry, I'm glad that my wife is different. One, in gender, okay, that's, that'd be a little creepy, all right? And then, second, I'm glad that she has her own mind, all right? We're, we're not clones here. We have different thoughts. We have different ideas. We have different likes and dislikes. That's how God made us. And don't take that away from me. I don't want to be a clone. I don't want to be, and, and also as a Christian, all right, that, and, and what's crazy is that's what the world wants. They're like, why are you different? Because God made me that way. Now get off me. Go back to your freakish world. And all of you look the same. You're all tattooed up and you all wear your saggy jeans or now it's like your tight gear. All right, you're all in your tight gear. Man, at least I know how to wear clothes. I mean, what in the world? But God made me that way. God made me as an individual. Quit putting me into a little box. I'll bust out of it, all right? So Genesis 1 and Psalm 8 tells us a biblical basis of it because God created us individually. Then Romans 14 is, and we're not, we don't have time to read it all, but Romans 14 is one of the greatest passages that help us understand soul freedom. It's a discussion that Paul is having with the church at Rome on uh, uh, problems that they were having. All right? It says, right in the start of Romans 14, him that is weak in the faith receives you, but not to double disputa dispu uh, disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. All right, and then look at verse 4. Who art thou that judges another man's servants to his own master? And it's going back and forth. Look at verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully, fully persuaded in his own mind. What is it saying? There's all kinds of differences within the church of Rome. So guess what he tells them? He goes down to verse 11. And he gives them a solution. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow. To me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's one of the bases of soul freedom. You know what? Really, in our church, it comes down to some of it. You know what, Dad? I'm going to preach, and I'll shuck it. I'll shuck it down, down your throat. Okay, but eventually, but I can't force you. You know why? Because Peter tells me that. Peter tells me how to shepherd, not by constraint, but willingly. I can't do that. But you know, some of it, like, hey, why, why aren't you booting him out? You know what? They're doing that. Guess what? Guess what? It's going to happen, Dad. You will give an account someday. My job is to do my job. My job is to preach the word, reprove, rebuke. And yes, uh, there are things that we bind together in covenant. All right, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bind, we, we don't bind together about everything. We, we bind together loosely. Why? Because as believers, you need to have soul freedom. You do. And, and, and all the differences, what you have to understand is you got to be settled in your mind. You get on your knees. You get in God's word. You determine what God has for you. And that's, even our young people here, it's always, it's always like, well, that church or this rule or that. You know what? You're going to answer to God. You're going to. So then every one of us will give an account of themselves. No, himself. Isn't that personal? That's soul freedom. You will answer to God for what you do with God, every one of us. It is sobering. This passage in Romans 14, it's one of the greatest passages teaching us that individually we answer before God. 
this concept of individual responsibility instead of collective responsibility is imperative in a believer's growth. It is also imperative to a nation's development of a strong citizenry. We've laughed, and this idea, so this is a Bible basis. I'm not making this up. We are all individually made. We all know that. God didn't just at the beginning of time say, poof, all right, there's a bunch of people. No, we were individually made by God. He formed man. That was his desire. And even the psalmist said that. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. And then every one of us will give an account. And so this collective thing, and that kind of, that crept into our society. Remember in the 80s and in the 90s? All of a sudden, we're getting these ridiculous lawsuits. Even now, I don't know if you've seen it, but I mean, there's, there's a, uh, what do they call that? It's a, it's a group of lawsuits, all right? So they, it's, um, it's a whole a group of, it's some lawyer that's going to make a huge paycheck, all right? But then everybody basically gets like five bucks, but the lawyer gets like a half a billion, all right? And he's like, hey, yeah, you've been, you've been hurt. And so there's, they're suing Johnson and Johnson who makes baby powder. You might have gotten something from I'm like, it's baby, I don't know. I mean, it was, it, was, it was padded on my rear when I was a baby. How do I know? I mean, what is up? But you know what, I caught something from that. Yeah, I'm twitching. All right, well, you always twitched. All right, they're like, you know what, you were always a freak. But now, all right, so I, I, think, I think something happened to me, so I'm going to get in on that and get my five bucks. Or then they're suing Roundup. Yeah, you tried to kill those weeds. Yeah, you did. And you weren't having your facial protection on properly. And in the COVID-19 days, you would have been spared. But guess what? You were out there killing them weeds like Death to you, death to you. And it was like, ha, 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 And it came back with vengeance down your throat. I, I don't know who in the world, some, some lawyer. But guess what I did? When I went to the store and I bought Roundup, I chose to buy it and spray my weeds and kill them. But somewhere in America, we've, we don't take personal responsibility for anything. For nothing. And why has that happened? Because of Bible freedom. When you restrict this, you restrict understanding. Because everybody is responsible for their own actions. Right, eventually, all right, as, as teenagers, all right, parents have a responsibility in their home, but as kids grow up, guess what you have to do? You have to decide, young man and young woman. You have to decide on your own, what God has for you. Not mommy, and, and I can pray with you, and, and actually there's biblical instruction on that, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I get tired of young people that grow up, and it's not, it's not just here, it's, it's basically everywhere. Everywhere, because it's our society, it's everybody else's fault that you're a loser. Actually, you were a loser when you were born. That's biblical. You were born from Adam, Adam, and you're a loser. All right? Now, guess what? Then you need to work at changing it. You need to understand that there's consequences, and the Bible says there's consequences for sin. And when you go down a road and you sin, own up to it. Take your medicine, suck it up, and get off your duff and go back and serve God again. But we have a society. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. My back hurts. I think it's from wrestling. I'm like, oh, for real? Your back hurts from wrestling? My back hurts and I never wrestled. All right, some of it is because, you know what? I ate, I ate a pound of cake last night. All right, and all of a sudden it went straight to my back. All right? I mean, some of us, it's silly. We're always trying to find excuses. There is a Bible basis, Genesis 1, Psalm 8. Romans 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, another Bible basis, 
uh, a verse, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Who's the all? All of us, all Christians. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You know, you will stand yourself, not collectively, yourself. That's what we have to understand. There's a Bible basis for soul freedom. So lastly then, what are some tips and some warnings? As what we said is soul freedom is probably one of the danger, most dangerous things that is out there. Why? Because right, this is what people, well, hey, I'm just doing my conscience. Well, your conscience is warped, you, you idiot. I'm like, what in the world? But that, now I can't say anything. Well, it's just, this is just this is how I worship. Like, well, yeah, but I'm going to preach down, the thro down your throat. Why? That's mean. Yeah, because I'm allowed to be mean. All right, because I'm individually made and God told me to be mean to you. All right, so get off me. Like, well, I, I, individual, individual, all right? But so what are some tips? Well, learn to, uh, here's a couple tips. Learn to appreciate different differences within our church family. Learn to appreciate differences. You know, there's, there's going to be differences of, of what people like in colors. All right, there's going to be differences in person. All right, what if all of us were like me? Unreal. You know, all right, we'd have a perfect church. All right. <laughs> Unbelievable. No, but that'd be, that'd be ridiculous. All right, what, what if they were all, I mean, we could pick somebody. All right, what, what if they were all like Mary? Oh, my word. All right, there's Mary. All right, every, I would be like, no, oh, please be quiet, 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 quiet. All right. But you know what? All of us have differences. And why can't we enjoy that? Why can't I enjoy that somebody likes something a little bit different? I mean, there's differences and there's some differences. And now, there's Bible principles, and we can't go against those Bible principles. And, and that's what we'll, what we'll touch on in, the, in one of the warnings. But... Learn to appreciate differences within our church family. Also, learn to appreciate differences within our church brethren. You know, there are things, uh, Jerry Ross and I are good friends. Every once in a while, we'll text each other some stupid thing um, that, because we're both, we, we, don't, we don't like texting, we don't like really anything social media at all, uh, but once in a while, we just like irritating somebody. All right, so we'll do that. But... Learn to appreciate differences. We're, we're a lot, we're, we're very different. He's country. All right, he keeps on joking. They're, he and uh, Pastor Sins are trying to teach me how to hunt. I grew up in Cleveland. I'm like, you know what? You know what you did when you heard bullets? You ducked. All right, that's what you did. You didn't, you, you're not trying to hunt. I mean, man, you hunt somebody, all right? All right, you hunt people, all right? But you don't, I mean, I, I'm not, and I told him, I said, at my age, I said, I'll just go and irritate the animals. All right, that's fun to me. All right, I'll throw something at them or do something like that. But I appreciate, I appreciate the differences even in our church brethren. And he and I have talked, and we said, you know what's irritating is some people highlight, it seems like all they highlight is the differences. He and I basically, we said basically there's almost everything we talk about, 99-something percent, we agree on, but people just like jump on the little, like, oh, 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 really? You believe Moses in the burning bush took off his, he had, he had open toe sandals? Oh, no, 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 that's, no. you're saying he had closed toe sandals? Oh, that's it. All right, I'm done with you. All right, that is over with. I'm like, it's sandals. But that's the way some of us are. It's so petty. Learn to appreciate differences within our church, brethren. Then learn to promote unity within our church family. Unity. You see that in the book of Acts, there's a, a unity that comes together, and that's what we should be promoting. So that's some tips. What are some warnings? Don't use soul freedom to become anti-authority. That is a separate issue. That's in the Bible, too, and you've heard me preach it. There is authority. So don't come and like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm not obeying my parents because it's my conscience. I'm pretty sure there's something in the Bible about it. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. 
So there still is authority. So that, that authority is given to you to help guide you in your worship and in uh, the proper way. So don't use soul freedom to be like, oh, you know what, I, I disagree with... The, I disagree with you. Well, when we have Bible to back up something, then you need to follow it. That's what you need to do. Don't use soul freedom to be anti-authority. Then don't use soul freedom to become hateful to others who oppose you. Because guess what's going to happen? You're going to have people that disagree. All right, and um, in the theological world, we have guys that are becoming Reformed Baptists. And Reformed Baptists, I think, is very dangerous Actually, um, uh, in my mind, uh, in honor of Roy Thompson, and I think I want to do it, it's slowly building, but Roy Thompson, if you knew him, could come up with some witty things, all right? Well, there's a witty article that is in his flavor. It is things that I'd love to do, but the Bible won't let me do, <laughs> all right? And one of those is be reformed. I'd love to be reformed. You know why? Reformed basically... You come to church on Sunday, and then the rest of the week, you chuck the Bible, and you do whatever you feel like. So you go drinking, you chuck standards, uh, you live like the devil, you, you, you know, you can do almost anything. And I'm like, you know what, man, I know why some, even some kids that have grown up here all of a sudden are reformed. You know why? Because basically, you can say that you believe Scripture, but you don't practice it. But the Bible won't let me do it. So you don't... A uh, big leader in Reformed is John MacArthur. No, I don't listen to him. I'm not going to follow him. But I've had some people that have told me, some pastor friends are like, you know what, I don't think John MacArthur is saved. I'm like, you know what, you're an idiot. You're an idiot and so is John MacArthur. <laughs> All right, both of you are. Because guess what? I mean, don't, just because someone opposes you, don't, don't become radical. Well, you're not saved. Actually, he probably is. He's just biblically wrong. <laughs> Don't use soul freedom to become hateful to others. Why? Because what's soul freedom say? I'm going to answer to God for what I do. So I can't do it. So every word, I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer for that. So you may have a brother or sister that is going against God. I understand it's hard. But remember, when you deal with them, you should be firm and you should be biblical, but you're going to answer for your actions. Remember that. Remember that. Then, thirdly, don't use soul freedom to make allowances for your sin. I've had people that are like, oh, you know what? This is just something I've come to. I believe that Jesus... When he turned the water into wine, it was just a boatload of, boatload of fresh wine, and I'm just drinking. I'm like, oh, no, did you study the words? Like, yeah, so I'm a drunkard. No, 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 that's not what the Bible is. All right, the Bible is clear on things, so don't, don't use the idea of soul freedom to sin. That's not what it's there for. Soul freedom is so that you can worship God yourself. And also, you'll answer to God yourself. Don't use soul freedom to espouse the belief in self-sufficiency either. All right, I have soul freedom. And that has kind of, so it kind of makes us individualistic and independent, doesn't it? Independent Baptist. But as I've said, I've told my staff, I believe some people are Baptists just because the word independent is there. They have no idea what Baptist means. They have no idea what church means. They really don't have any idea of theology. They really don't know that the Bible is involved. They just heard the word independent. They're like, yeah! Oh, I'm independent! I'm like, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking that they're just like, yeah! All right, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're on their Harleys. They've got leather. I mean, they're shooting. Yeah, I'm independent! All right, and the flag, anytime the flag, I mean, the flag's all around their house. I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, I never hear you talk about Bible, but like, independent! But that's the way some of us are. And that's what's kind of happened in America. In America, we've jumped on the independent, but we forgot that there's a Bible involved. We're not self-sufficient. Even though I believe in soul freedom, even though I believe that I have 
the right to worship God the way I believe, it's actually I'm still worshiping God and I'm dependent upon him. I'm dependent upon God. Saw a bumper sticker one time. It said this, real bold, make up your mind. I think it was trying to get a, a point across. The Old Testament equivalent is Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve. The Baptist word for the world is that each individual is free to make up your mind. You are. But you're going to answer for how you make up your mind. You're going to answer for it. You will. Not mommy. Not Now, there is some responsibility there. I understand that. But that's what we have got to understand. And that's why as a pastor, I hope, and I understand that sometimes, all right, I'm, I'm a... I'm not a, a light preacher, I would say. I really am passionate and intense on, uh, have an intensity on Scripture, and I love it, but I can't force you. I can't do it. I can't force you to love God, because you know all that? The only reason you're doing it then is, well, well it, it, does the pastor know? That's a, bad, that's a bad sign in a church, because guess what? God knows. He knows. He knows what you're doing. Some people will do almost anything to avoid responsibility in their life. They'll quote other people. They'll talk like other people. They let other people talk for them. They even choose, let other people choose for them. Sooner or later, the question that Jesus said to his disciples has got to resonate in your little brain. Whom say ye? that I am. It's your choice. You have to decide. Robert Winthrop lived in the 1800s. He served as Speaker of the House. He was also a senator. He gave a, an address. Think about this. <laughs> a senator today doing this. He gave an address at the Massachusetts Bible Society in 1849. What he said in that address is a fitting conclusion. This is what he said. All societies of men must be governed in some way or other. The less they may have of stringent state government, the more they have of individual self-government. The less they rely on public law or physical force, the more they rely on private moral restraint. Men, in a word, must necessarily be controlled either by a power within them or by a power without them. Either by the word of God or by the strong arm of man, either by the Bible or the bayonet. You know what we're experiencing in our society? We put this aside, Bible freedom. And what this world did not understand is when you restrain this and restrict it, what you are not doing is having teaching on temperance, on self-government, and self-restraint, because that's what the Bible brings into a society. And that's why for the last couple weeks I've been trying to tell you, as our society, and I understand a lot in the world, they don't understand this. But I don't have a problem, and I told our church members this, I don't have a problem you sitting up in the balcony, you're saying, you know what, I, I'm a little skittish about the coronavirus. Uh, you can sit out in the parking lot and listen in the parking lot, and you can go down to the chapel and ask Joel to live stream it, but that's your choice. Why? Because our church, we've tried to, we tried to instill in our folks a biblical freedom, and understanding of personal responsibility. And you know what? Eric knows this. Our insurance contacted us. Like, oh, you better be careful about this. You better be careful about this. There's certain things that if you do them, we're not going to cover you. I said, I don't care. Baloney. I don't do things for our church because of insurance coverage. 
We make a decision because of the individual responsibility and freedom of our members. And if they got to take our building, they take our building. Because you know what? We have a heritage. A heritage of men that said that soul freedom is bound and found in the Word of God. It transfers to a people when they try to follow the Word of God. And each and every one of us will give an account of himself before the Lord. So my question then as we close, whom say you that Christ is? Because you will answer. You will answer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you for your patience. And hopefully, there's a lot of reading, and that's why I try to give you that outline now so that if there's something that is there, hopefully you can fill it out and maybe you do your own further study on it. But there's men that we talked about. There's definitions. There's Bible that you can look up, and you can look up some commentators on it. But why? Because this idea of soul freedom is very important, and in our church it's very important. Why? Because you will give an account. You have a responsibility. I have, an, uh, I have a responsibility when people come to me. I was talking with a church member recently, and you know what? They have their own conscience, and I mean, their own children are trying to ask them to go against their conscience. You know, at, at some point, you know, you, you're going to do that, but you can't ask me to be a party of the sin. I answer to God. And what about you this evening? Have you thought that you will answer for yourself before God, for your actions? Have you been tossing it on somebody else? Personal responsibility is tied to our soul freedom because it's also personal accountability. Maybe this evening God dealt with you. May God help us to become better students of the word, better students of history, so that our church can become stronger, a better lighthouse, so that we can help our community become better citizens.